no matter how much she told me exactly what to do to help our relationship, I was never going to hear it until I decided this is what I want to fix about myself. And this is how I want to build a better relationship with her until I decided that myself and found those tools myself. It was never going to happen. And in your book, I found those tools. I really did. But your book is changing my life. It really is. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. So the reason why Tyler is here with us today is because he popped up on my live stream and said, I got fixed that shit for men. And it gave me some revelations and it helped me view some of my behaviors in a different light. And I wanted you to come here and share your story with us, share what it is that you've learned and share how things have changed. So hi, Tyler, thank you for coming today. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for taking the time. I was so excited about this. I've literally been, I've been, so I'm here in my car. I've been sitting in my car for like 15 minutes, just (laughs) waiting to get in. No, it's been, it really triggered something in me to where, I guess a little background on me. So I'm an engineer. I use a lot of analytical skills and logical skills while I'm at work. And I realized after a while, I wasn't applying any of those at home. I was just kind of making decisions as they came up. I wasn't applying any planning. I wasn't looking forward into the future. I was just kind of dealing with things as they came up. And so I've been married before. So my current wife is actually my second wife, my second marriage. And I realized going into this marriage very recently after actually I went to your live that I had a lot of baggage from the previous marriage that I had never dealt with, emotional and otherwise. So when I found your live, it kind of triggered a couple of things in my brain. I said, okay, I've been, you know, you know, kind of head to the grindstone, trying to push, trying to force things to be good. When I hadn't looked at myself at all, I hadn't analyzed my own behaviors And I hadn't analyzed the fear, anxiety, the underlying depression, the personal issues that I hadn't dealt with that are affecting my new marriage. And so, so I kind of had a couple of, you know, aha moments during your live, you know, about, you know, what it really means to be a, you know, a selfless, a generous, you know, forward thinking man. And I realized that does not describe me at all. Wow. And I kind of had this big epiphany that goes, I don't do any of the thing, you know, hardly any of the things that she's talking about. What are desirable qualities of man? I thought I had been, but I never analyzed it. Right. I never looked at it. I ne- never applied those skills I had learned in school and at my job to myself. You know, I realized that I had set all these habits of, you know, you know, emotional manipulation and, you know, trying to force situation to be more favorable towards me. You know, I was doing those selfish behaviors. I was doing that short-term thinking. I was living that life as a guy, as you say in your lives, I (laughs) wasn't being a man. Right. And, you know, my wife, funny enough, is actually a psychologist. She's a degree psychologist. And she would tell me these things. You know, we'd have conversations where she goes, you know, it seems like you're, you know, prioritizing yourself. You're, you know, you're maintaining the selfish attitude. There's other people you know, you have to consider these things, you know, these are my needs and you're not meeting them. And until very recently, I took that very personally. I said, okay, you know, but I never looked at like, I guess I have had the wrong mindset about it. I said, why is she upset about these things? I'm working so hard. I'm trying to do these things. I'm trying to provide, I'm trying to, you know, be an open person. I'm trying to do all these works, why is it not working? Why is she still not happy? Right. And I realized that I had never done that internal work. I was internalizing a lot of emotions. I wasn't expressing them. I wasn't being vulnerable and open. And I was, a lot of times I was just kind of doing things to diffuse the situation we were in, AKA avoiding. I was trying to, you know, I was implying these avoidance tactics that I had been doing my whole life, but I I never made that connection. 
And so what I started le- learning when I was, you know, starting the book, you know, fix that shit. I was realizing that 99% of those things were under my control and I wasn't controlling them. I was expecting my wife to take that emotional baggage off of me, take that weight off of me. I put it on her and it was too much for one person. She was doing all the emotional labor and I was doing almost none of it. You know, I was physically working hard. I was, you know, trying to maintain the household. I was trying to, you know, do my best at work, put in the effort at work. And I was confused about how she was still upset. And it, there were, there was a lot of yelling fights. There was a lot of disagreements that we never resolved. There was a lot of resentment building between the two of us, her side and my side. I resented her for a lot of things for, you know, expressing herself because I, took it personally it you know it hit my ego and I didn't like that mm-hmm. <laughs> so and so what I've been learning in the book is to take those negative emotions that I had been pushing off you know I'll deal with that later I don't need that right now I need to focus on the, you know what I'm trying to do yeah. what that was doing was building those negative behaviors that I was never fixing and so I would just repeat the cycle over and over again to where I was emotionally abandoning my wife, I was emotionally abandoning my children, and I wasn't addressing any of the problems. I just thought if I just bear down and knuckle down and push through it, you know, like, you know, my dad always told me, just be a man, just provide for your family, all those things. I was never addressing the real, the, the real source of the problem. It was a lot of those negative behaviors that I had picked up in my, you know, kind of younger years to where I deny the problem exists, push it off for somebody else, put the baggage on somebody else, you know, you know, basically just, you know, be a man, close off, you know, do what you need to do. And I realized that none of those things contribute to a healthy relationship. So after your first live that I saw, I started the, the two five second kisses per day with my wife. Amazing. So Literally that same day, I tried to employ that. I wasn't successful every day. You know, as you could, as you could see, there was, we had some issue we had to work through. So it was a little tough going at first. Yeah. As soon as I started making that a habit, I saw an immediate shift in my interactions with my wife. And it was just a, it was a little thing. It was, a, it was 10 seconds per day. Yes. She seemed less frustrated with me. She was more, you know, open to, you know, have conversations rather than just be frustrated and shut down and say, it's fine, let's move on. She wanted to have the conversation. She wanted to express herself emotionally. And what I found is I had an easier time connecting. Yeah. Is that small physical touch, that spark that we felt when we first got together. Yeah. It was coming back. And... And so since then, it's grown and grown. We have our setbacks. I tend back into that selfish mentality because it's what I've done my whole life. Right. I've been going to personal therapy myself. My wife is also in therapy and she carries a lot of trauma with her too. She had a tough childhood. She was, she was actually an active military veteran. So she's a retired veteran with the U.S. Army, excuse me. And so she carried a lot of those previous traumas and she'd been married before too. So she carried a little lot of that baggage and the biggest issue we had was acting off of that emotional trauma from our past, not discussing it with each other and trying to push forward anyway. Yeah. And I'm realizing that was not bringing us closer. That was not helping us perform as a team. That was keeping us on two separate islands, trying to yell at each other or trying to get, you know, the ship going down the channel between us, we were just waving flags and, you know, trying to try hand signals from yeah. miles away on these two separate islands. And it wasn't working. The further I get into the book, you talk about, it was fairly early on, the basically addressing your ego. Yeah. And, and you know, my whole life, you know, and, you know, I don't want to put all the blame on, you know, my family and my upbringing. It could, it, ultimately, it's my decision, right? Right. It's how I process things. It's how I have to recognize these things and address them myself. And, you know, my my habit was to not connect. It was to dissociate. It was to avoid. 
that was how I lived my life. And so far it worked out pretty good, but I got to this relationship where I was not acting as I should. And that coupled with my wife's own thing she was trying to deal with put a huge wedge. It was a huge, it was a wedge we could kind of fake and deny for a little while, but eventually it reared its head. The walls came down, the mask I put on went away. We both revealed our two selves. And that's kind of when all the problems and issues started. And those barriers we had started affecting our relationship. Yeah. And really up until I, you know, kind of started getting back into therapy and I found your book in your lives, I was so confused about why it wasn't working. I'm like, I'm doing all the things that I know how to do. And it's not working. And what I realized is I didn't have any tools to deal with those things. I had never been given those tools. I never sought them out. I never saw the issue. I never made those connections. So what your book really did, it, it made those kind of obvious things that you can look at somebody else's relationship and go, oh, I, I know what's going on there. I can see what they're doing wrong. He's obviously not listening to her and she's not really you know, hearing him. But I couldn't analyze it to myself. I had my big old ego in the way. And so when I really started, when I kind of, kind of what your book gave me was those, is some of those tools, is those practical applications to recognize those feelings, those emotions that I did have, no matter how much I denied them, I had them. Yeah. But I was trying to bury them, swallow them, push them down, and utterly not even recognize them and so my ego essentially just took over and basically said how can I make the situation better for myself and I never thought about the expense of what that was yes so you know while I was keeping my thoughts internal I wasn't analyzing my internal thoughts does that make sense yes absolutely Um, and so with your the characterization of the ego as the whoosh yeah. When someone says something that that triggers that little spark, they go, hey, oh, no, that's not an analysis I like about myself. Yeah. And it, yeah, like you said, it rises up. And what I would do is I said I would and normally I would just shut down and go, that's not true. Yeah. I don't know why she said that. I'm going to counter that with something I think about myself that is true. And I don't care about what she thinks about it. And I'm not going to validate her emotions about it. What I started doing is going like, and it, I'm literally taking it verbatim from the book. Is there truth to that statement? I take that second and I go, is there truth to that statement? And 98% of the time, my wife, I'll tell you, my wife, she doesn't lie. Yeah. Literally, she does it. Like, even to save my feelings, she doesn't lie. Yeah. She'll go, yeah, no, that's not gonna, that's not how it's gonna go. And I am so thankful for that. For a while, I kind of resented that. I was like, you could just throw me a little bone here, you know, just make me feel better. But no, she never. And that's, and then what I realized is after kind of analyzing those personal feelings, that's how she expresses love is through that truth yeah. is through that. Hey, here's what's wrong with you. Here's how you can fix it. Here's how we can be a better couple. You got to fix that shit. That and it's sense. literally like she's, she is your book pretty much personified Uh. and I realized that she could tell me all she wants but I was blocked by so much of these personal emotional issues that I was not dealing with that I wasn't hearing it she could tell me all she wants she could you know hold me by the head and scream at me till she's blue in the face and I was it, it wasn't computing yeah and what it was is you know, what I'm realizing, and I just talked to my therapist about this, and she says, as adults, we're honestly a little bit worse than toddlers. We hate being told what to do. That it has to come from inside if we want to make the exact. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what? Just because you said that, I'm not going to do it. Mm. And I was throwing temper tantrums. I really right. was. I was, I, you know, I was forgetting that she was my wife. I was assigning her this mother slash villain persona where if I did anything wrong she was going to be mad at me I was going to get punished and 
her emotions didn't matter because she was basically the taskmaster on my life. And I didn't like that. I was going to rebel. Right. And for a while, this was all subconscious and I really wasn't aware of it on a surface, you know, on a conscious level, it was so ingrained as a habit to me. And as an adult, I didn't like being told what to do hundred percent and nobody really does. So no matter how much she told me exactly what to do to help our relationship, I was never going to hear it until I decided this is what I want to fix about myself. And this is how I want to build a better relationship with her until I decided that myself and found those tools myself, it was never going to happen. Yeah. And in your book, I found those tools. I really did. It's, it's, I, like, I don't want to elevate your, you know, your book to this kind of, you know, deification, but your book is changing my life. It really is. It really is changing my life. It's giving me that, kind of internal narrative that I never developed as a child to where I can look at my own behavior and go, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at this logically. (laughs) Did that reaction help me or did it hurt? Did that reaction help my relationship or did it drive a wedge into my relationship? Did it, did that reaction bring us closer together as a couple or did it push us further apart? You know, was it a reaction that was seeking a loving connection or was it a self-preservation tactic of emotional violence really? Yeah. And I started making those comparisons like, okay, what's the loving response? What's the selfish response? Which one is going to make things better? And Every time it's the loving response, it's seeking that connection. It's making those choices to not just build up my wife, but really take a hit out of my ego and go, hey, I'm going to give this person a vulnerable side of me. I'm going to give this person deference that there is truth to what she just said. I was being a dickhead. I was being an asshole. I was not thinking of her first. I was not giving her that validation that she was asking for. I was protecting myself for no other reason other than I didn't want to be in trouble. Right. I was putting her in that role that was not a partner that was making us unequal. And I realized I've got to, I've got to even the scales that she is on my team. Yeah. That she does want us to grow close together. That yeah. she doesn't want to be constantly telling me everything I did wrong. Yeah. She doesn't. Yeah. She wants to build me up in those ways. And I had to change how I was analyzing the situations, apply the tools I had gained in my education, which are 100% applicable. And, you know, it's, I just, I never put the two together. I would change my brain at home versus when I was at work because that's what my dad did. Right. You know, that's what my parents, they would they would compartmentalize. Yeah. You know, work was work, home was home, and there's no, there's nothing that bridges those two. It's yeah. totally separate. When really, they couldn't be more alike. I mean, the working relationship is, in a lot of ways, no different than personal relationships in that communication needs to be constant. Sometimes you need to humble yourself and go, Hey, I screwed up. Yeah. Can you help me fix it? Yeah. You know, I can't be right. And I always, and I have to, I had to learn how to say, I don't know. You know, I've kind of had this anxiety of always trying to have the answer. And when I started doing it with my wife, she knows when I don't know. Right. And usually when she asks me the question, she knows if I know the answer or not. She knows what the answer is. And if I try and play something up to save face, she knows about it. Mm-hmm. And the best part is she calls me on it. And I held resentment for that for a long time. But now I realize it's just her trying to reach out to me to say, hey, we could have connected over this and you chose to not do that. Right. And I want to let you know that I don't want that. I don't want to disconnect over these things. I don't want you to put up that wall. She's, you know, she's saying, I want to connect with you. 
And she doesn't always say it's words, but that's what those situations are for. Everything is an opportunity to build closer to that, you know, the closest to my wife and to my kids. And I wasn't doing that. And this whole journey, I'm just getting started in it. And I feel like I'm finally making a step towards really saving my marriage. Uh. I really am. And I really, and I honestly cannot thank you enough for giving me that key to kind of unlock my mind, essentially. Yeah. To look at it from a whole new perspective, to pull outside of myself, look at it more objectively and go, hey, there's merit to what she's saying. She's not just trying to be mean. She's not trying to be naggy. She's not trying to be this negative influence on me. She just wants to connect. Yes. You know, and I, you know, growing up, I never really had those kind of connections and I never learned how to have those connections. Yeah. I just was like, hey, this seems right for my life. This is what other people are doing or this is what my parents want or this is what society is calling for me to do. Or, you know, this is my impulse desire at the moment. Yeah. I never looked beyond those outside factors and I never looked at like, okay, what's my long-term goal here? You know, what do I want out of this relationship and what, how do I bring her in to have that partnership? You know, cause I wasn't an Island anymore. Yeah. We were two people that were supposed to be working in the same direction steering the same ship and i was over here on one of the sails trying to pull the rope hard enough to where it would go the direction i want to go and that wasn't working right so yeah so when i say your book is changing my life i'm not even sugarcoating it it is giving me a whole new perspective on on generally everything when it comes to my relationship you know who else's life is being changed your kids Mm -hmm. Because monkey see, monkey do. Just like you told us, you're following your dad's lead. And you thought because he did, that was the right thing to do. Because monkey see, monkey do. If other people are doing it, it must be the right thing to do. But we can't trust who raised us if they were dysfunctional. We can't trust our culture because our culture literally wants us to be dysfunctional. You've heard the term retail therapy. Our culture wants us to be so unhappy, we purchase our happiness because we live in a capitalistic culture. So we can't trust what culture says either because our culture says arguing and fighting is normal and healthy. But when we think about the kids who grew up watching us, would you tell your children, pick somebody to fight with? Or would you tell your children, pick somebody to be happy and peaceful with? So we have to start unsubscribing from our culture because it doesn't have our best interest at heart. And we have to redefine how to be in relationships because we are being watched. And the next generation is going to repeat what they witnessed just like you did. And then you, the parents, set a better example of love and communication and functionality and affection and friendship and respect That's what they're going to go recreate for themselves. So I'm not just proud of you and your wife. I'm proud of what you're doing for your children. Because that's my goal. My goal doesn't end with you. My goal is the generations. I call this the evolution revolution because we're evolving who we're choosing for a relationship by how we choose them, not picking a stranger, picking the right person so that we don't fight and argue trying to change them. And we're evolving how we're being in relationships, taking responsibility for our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors because it is our responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And I would never take that responsibility. I would always find somebody else to blame for it. Oh, it's because of what you said. Oh, it's because of what my dad told me or, Mm -hmm. oh, it's because of, you know, what this Facebook video showed me. Right. And I realized that I, yeah, I was shirking all the responsibility. I was putting it off on somebody else. So I didn't have to be held accountable for my bad behaviors. Yeah. We do that because we think It's going to make us feel better to not have to shoulder the responsibilities. But now that you're on the other side, in other words, now that you're choosing more functional behaviors, are you finding that you feel better faster by taking responsibility? 100%. 
Uh, 100%. It, the very beginning, it's in, I don't know, I, I loved your chapter about fear, about how letting fear ruling our lives. And that was exactly how I was living. It was that fear of rejection. It was the fear of letting someone down that I loved. It was the fear of, you know, realizing I had done something selfish and how that would affect the situation. So I always tried to avoid it, push it off, do something else with it. Yeah. trying to protect myself but all I was doing was harming my partner yeah all I was doing was seeding that mistrust it was seeding that disrespect it was not giving her the opportunity to have a loving response right to whenever I had a moment where I didn't do the thing I was needing to do right and not taking that responsibility while it staved off those negative emotions for the time being they would always fester and they would always come back and they would always spread out. Yeah. And now that I'm taking that responsibility, that first instant is, oh, I have been, oh, I have wounded myself because I have done the wrong thing. Right. Yeah. But so much faster it goes into a point where my wife and I can connect. She can offer assistance. She can show me those understanding thoughts and emotions. You know, she goes, it's okay. I forget too. Yeah. She can forgive me immediately. She can forgive me. Because and that's the thing. Responsibility. Yeah. Because you took responsibility. And I mean, the mental gymnastics it takes to not take responsibility tires you out and drains you so much more than taking a minute to say you're right. Exactly. 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 And it, as far as mental gymnastics went, I was Carrie Shrug. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was a master of it. And yeah, and I was exhausted all the time trying to keep up with this web of lies I had created. It was a second, it was a second life I had to juggle with the actual reality of life. And it was, I was, it was too much. And I, I was utterly failing at it. Mm -hmm. And I, and it's not, and I realize it's not what I'm meant to do as a human. It's I'm meant to connect with people. I'm meant to have those vulnerable mm -hmm. points in my life. So sorry, I had an alarm going off, uh, okay. but I was meant to, I was meant to have those connections with my loved ones because that's what it's for. Yeah. It's for it. That's the most satisfying thing in life is what I'm realizing. You know, you can have all the stuff in the world. You can have all the money in the world, you can have the best job ever. But if you don't have no one to share it with, if you have no one to connect with, it's all meaningless. It's completely empty. You know, I you know, look at all these people, you know, they're, you know, you look at, you know, the whole world, you see, you know, I went on a few mission trips when I was, you know, in church and in high school. And we'd see these people who have absolutely nothing to the name but they have these strong tied fa family units and they were some of the happiest people i'd ever met i had the opportunity to go to haiti back when i was in college haiti is one of the poorest countries in the western world i have never seen more happy people per capita in my entire life i look around me and you know it's also opportunity i, I live down here in texas so it's going to be really hot today but i've there's miserable people everywhere everywhere and you know we live in this very affluent area and there's no happy people you know i see these people who are separated from everybody who try and find joy in buying things and you know like participate in the capitalistic society and they're empty inside and there's no joy in their lives yeah. you know and you can tell when someone's faking it you get to know them well enough you can tell when they're faking it. you know you can tell when they're putting up a front and I realized that so th those material things, those outward projections of happiness are ultimately empty. Yeah. And that true joy and happiness can be found in your personal relationships. And I have an amazing wife. She might be the best person I've ever met. And our kids, I have never been more joyful than when I see my kids succeed and love one another. and. I don't know. Sorry, I'm getting a little, but <laughs> it's okay. We love we love men. Men are emotional. I've I've never questions. I've never had 
such utter and pure joy than, and this is a specific example of seeing my son. He's in the marching band in high school and they have the opportunity to go to Indianapolis for a marching competition. And this was last year. And he's a, he's a sophomore and he actually, he has autism. So he's on the autism spectrum, very high functioning, the smartest kid I've ever met. You know, he's a little socially awkward, but you know, he has these moments where I just see this pure joy come from him that is unadulterated by anything in the world. And seeing them finish their marching show and seeing how excited he was at their accomplishment, I just, mm -hmm. I've never experienced a joy like that in anything else. And it was, and I, you know, at the time I was kind of still in my, I was still in my old habits, but it was a pure moment that I would never replace for anything. And that's what life is about. That's what it is. It's about seeing those emotional connections and, you know, and I, I hugged him after that show. When we got to see him. And it's hard to describe really in words it that was the top that was it that was the top yeah and my wife was there and my other kids were there too and it, I've never I had never experienced that kind of level of vulnerable emotional connection is in that moment when all of his work culminated to this one single point and he put everything he had into it, and I was just there to support him. And, you know, my wife was there. We were all there to support him, and he gave that back to us with that unfiltered expression of love. You know, he has, you know, he has certain sensory issues, so he doesn't like to touch people. He's not a big hugger. He's not, you know, big into, he gave me the biggest bear hug. I had ever had and he's a he's a big kid he's about six foot 270 so he's bigger than me yeah and I could just I could feel the emotions coming from him and they were transferring to me and I just it was I can't <laughs> I could go to space and not experience the same level of joy as I felt in that moment and I realized that's the peak that's the goal for me that's what I want in life I want, want that connection and I want it with all the people that are in my life that I hold in that loving regard. That's what I want. That's what I want in life. And that's, and you know, your book and your advice and your videos and all of your content is, is helping me towards that. It's pointing me in the right direction and it's giving me the tools I can use to reach those points and reach those moments as often and as, you know, for, as often as possible. I mean, you know, I want to, that's where I want to live. I don't care where on the earth I live. I don't care the size of house. I don't care what car I drive. I want those moments. And that's what my life purpose is, is to have those connections with the people I love I and to be able to express those emotions. Yes. To be able to express those emotions. There's a word that you used a couple of times, and I like to clarify this word. And I want to make a comment on that. And then I want to ask you a question about this very thing. Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. People use the word vulnerability. And I like to define it very simply so that I think it kind of illuminates the understanding of what that word actually means. I like to define vulnerability as telling the truth, honesty. That's what vulnerability is. It's being honest you re regardless of whether or not it's going to have a negative effect on you, right? I'm honest about my emotions. I'm honest about my thoughts. And I do it even if it's going to put a bullet in your gun. I'm honest about myself. I trust you to be honest with you. So, you know, you use that in terms of like overcoming your ego in the moments when you feel the whoosh and your wife said you're a dick right now. <laughs> and so, right? so, and you feel that whoosh and you say, you know what, I'm going to be vulnerable in this moment. And that means I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to say 
You're right. So in those moments, I want people to, I'm curious myself, I want to know what is it that you turn around and say now to your wife instead of the ego thing you used to do, which was pushing aside what she said and rejecting it. So, yeah. So before I would try to come up with a little lie to get me out of the situation or avoid it, right? But now when she tells me, that's obviously not true. You didn't do this or, you know, you're being a dick right now. I go, yeah, I'll, I'll take that moment. I pause to analyze the emotion that I'm feeling. And I go, and I'll usually go something to the effect of, you know, honey, you're right. And what can I do next time to help the situation? You know, you know, I didn't, we don't always have time for conversation, but I go, honey, I want to talk to this, talk about this with you. Can we do it later? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, can we explore this a little further? And nine times out of 10, she'll say, yes, absolutely. We can talk about it. Yeah. She goes, I want to say that you were being a dick. We can explore that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and she's always open to the conversation. And, you know, sometimes we'll have it. Then I'll go, honey. I want to, I want to tell you how sorry I am. You know, I've, what I've started doing is I'm, I, when I find myself in situations where she says something that, that wounds my ego, right? I always begin with an apology. Always been with, you know what, honey, you're right. I'm sorry. And just acknowledging the truth, because a real apology is where you identify what you are responsible for and you acknowledge mm -hmm. that. Yes. And in, in the past, I would apologize for how my decision affected her. And I would not apologize for the behavior. Right. And now I apologize for the behavior. It's like, I'm sorry I did that. I'm yeah. sorry that I said that. That was not right of me to say that. Yeah. You're correct. That was, I didn't have to say that. I could have said it another way. And what I'm noticing is when I recognize those behaviors, she is much more quickly to accept my apology, yes. to be open to a conversation about it, you know, because nine times out of 10, if she tells me, you didn't make that decision for me, you made a decision for you. And I'll be convinced, no, I made that for you. I was doing that for you. But I really was, I almost never was. It was for me. Yeah. And until I started recognizing that, all that built was resentment, disconnection, unlove, yeah. and those negative thoughts and feelings about myself, about her, about me. And it contributed to driving that wedge. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm accepting those behaviors, how I acted, I'm taking responsibility for them. She is always open to talk about it. Always. Yeah. She always really has been, but I've always tried to shut down the conversation because I didn't want to talk about it. Now that I am willing, now that I am participating in those conversations, being open-minded enough to take what she's saying, find the truth in it, and acknowledge it, of course. And it's working. It it's really is. It's working. It makes it so easy. It was so hard to find all the ways I wasn't what he was saying. It was so hard to find all the ways this wasn't my fault. It's so easy to acknowledge the truth, take responsibility for my part. Three part apology, I'm sorry, four. I realize the outcome this had on you. This is my plan for not doing this again. What is there left for them to say except I appreciate oh. that? I forgive you. And then and it's off the weight is off, isn't it? It's over. Yeah. It, it's we can move on. And so, what I'm trying to focus on now is building those new habits. Yeah. of applying what we've talked about, of applying our conversations yeah. to my future behaviors, yes. you know, not falling back in the old patterns, really taking it to heart. And I was going to say something, you know, before I would 
shit, I lost it. It'll come back to me. It'll come That's back. Okay. To me. Anyway. So growth is a stock market chart, mm -hmm. right? It's a jagged yeah. line. It's a stock market chart. That's what your growth is. It's up and it's down, but as long as you keep saying to yourself, what is my intention? Like you said earlier, what is my intention? Is this behavior, you use the word did, and then you switched over to will, which is exactly what we're doing, right? So we're taking like, when you say did, you looked at your past behaviors and you said, were the behaviors I was choosing aligning with what I wanted, which is a happy marriage? No. So then I start switching it up. Is the behavior I'm going to do aligning with my goal of having a happy marriage? No. Choose a different behavior. So I love I love the recognition of yourself in this. And I love the desire to tap into that peacefulness and being proactive with the choice of behaviors and taking that pause so that you can better choose those behaviors. Right. Yeah. And it's, it really is making a change and I'm seeing, oh, what I was going to say. Okay. So, you know, for the longest time, I always thought that these negative behaviors didn't leave myself, right. you know, these negative, I guess, yeah, the behaviors, they really didn't affect anybody. I didn't think they affected anybody. It was just me saving myself and we're moving on. You know, nobody cares. And, you know, growing up my whole family, they would just do the same thing. They'd say the negative behavior, move it on. We'll talk about it later. Don't, don't worry about it. But what I realized and the real kind of, <laughs> my wife likes to call it, and I've adopted this talk, my coming to Jesus moment yeah, was when I saw my negative behavior being mirrored in my children with how they interacted with each other and with me. Yeah. And when I saw that behavior mirrored back to me, I was like, whoa, that's affecting me negatively. Yeah. But I recognized that behavior. Who? That's me. That's me. That is what I, those are my exact words. That is how I read situations. And I'm feeling the effects of those negative behaviors and I said, hey, I did this. This yeah. was me. And I was like, okay, I have to do something about this. But at that time, I didn't know what to do. I said, okay, I got to change my outside behaviors. I got to try and work harder at this. I got to push harder at this. And it only got worse because I still wasn't addressing those internal habits. Have you seen a shift in your kids since you've had a shift in your behaviors? It's slow going, but yes, I am seeing a shift in my kids. They are speaking to each other with more love, with more understanding. Uh, so I've got two 13-year-olds, I've got a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old. Okay. And my 13-year-olds, they're twins. It's a boy and a girl twin. Okay. And they love to beat each other's throats. Yeah. They will find any and all opportunity to argue about something, no matter how stupid or inconsequential it is, they will find a way to argue about it. And when I was seeing those behaviors in myself, I would try to address them externally, like at them when they're having a conversation. And I thought it might turn into an argument. I tried to cut it off. But what I realized is I wasn't allowing them to process those emotions. And it got to a point where they would start stopping me and go, dad, we're just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not arguing. There's no issue here. But I was only looking at the external. I wasn't analyzing it emotionally. Okay. I was just looking at external, trying to stop something I viewed was not good. And I was cutting them off at the heels to analyze the situations emotionally. I wasn't allowing them to have that processing. And it was turning them into me who didn't process anything emotionally. Because I thought that was the way to do it. You avoid conflict. You don't have the conflicts. You don't have the conversations. You never address it. And you go on like nothing happened. And I was realizing they, they stopped arguing. And they stopped analyzing. And they stopped seeking out that connection with each other. And, they, and it drove them apart. Right. And that was when the wheels started turning. I was like, okay. I recognize this behavior. This is kind of what I do. I don't like to have conflicts. They happen anyway. I'm not addressing the problems and we have the same arguments over and over again. 
So I said, okay, I'm going to turn internally. I'm going to analyze those things internally and start projecting that positive behavior rather than trying to stop their bad behavior. Because like you said, monkey see, monkey do. Once they started seeing it from me, they took those opportunities to come closer. Yeah. So we actually had their 13th birthday party over on Saturday. Okay. It went off without a hitch. They interacted. It was amazing. And it was a stressful time for sure. Right. You know, my wife and I playing the whole thing. We had to decorate the house. We had to change the whole backyard setup. There was a lot of work involved, a lot of shopping, a lot of coordinating with people. You know, my wife's side of the family showed up. My side of the family showed up. Each of them had about 10 friends. We had like 45 people at our house that was not designed for 45 people. But we pulled it off. Right. My wife and I, we worked together to collaborate. We made our lists. We stuck to them. We planned things out. We, you know, we held each other accountable and said, okay, you're responsible for this. I'm going to take care of this. We're going to take care of this. We're going to work on this together. This is more job for, for more than one person. We're going to work together on this. We're going to bring the kids in. Mm-hmm. You know, we connected on all those levels. And there was not a fight. Mm-hmm. There was not an argument. There was not a screw it. Let's shut it all down. We're not having it this year. There was no threats of sending everybody home, but there was no explosion. There was no World War III. Mm-hmm. There was just us coming together as a family, encouraging our kids to help out, to take some of that load. Because yeah. something like this is not for one person. You can't do it with one person. You need more people to, to spread the load out. Yeah. I mean, we had a cook for 45 people in our kitchen that's made to cook for three people. You know, it's like it's it's looking at it objectively. It's an impossible situation. Mm-hmm. There's no way we could have done it if it was just one person working on everything. Yeah, there's not there was not enough time. There's not enough time, not enough energy in a single person. So we had to come together. We were, I want to say forced into it, but it was it had to go that way. And I found that. With the efforts I'm making where I was seeking to connect with my wife on all these different levels, she was much more willing to collaborate. You know, in the past when we needed to collaborate, something like planning a vacation or planning a family outing, I would say I wanted to help. I really didn't. And all of the emotional baggage and all the emotional weight and the emotional load was a hundred percent on her. She would get burned out and she would, pop off at everybody she would get frustrated she would get short-tempered and generally everybody would have a bad time in the past i'd be like what's her problem you know what's wrong you know what went wrong here we were having a good time then she just had a whole meltdown and decided to just go off on everybody for no reason and then i and now i'm realizing in the situations because i wasn't taking any responsibility I was blaming other people. I was shirking my responsibility. I was doing something that I've learned about. It's called weaponized incompetence, <laughs> where basically I would pretend I didn't know how to do it, so I wouldn't have to do it. She would just say, fine, I'm taking over. I'd be like, okay, cool. Sounds good. I don't have to do anything now. We're good. You know, and it was too much for one person. And I realized I can't do that anymore. That's not going to lead to a healthy and loving relationship. It's not going to lead to a long-term relationship. You're right. She's gonna get fed up with it at some point oh, yeah. and go, you're out of here. Adios. You're gone. And she's, yeah. you know, she said, you know, kind of when we were in the trenches, which we're coming out now, we're climbing out of the foxhole now. When you're <laughs> in the trenches, she'd go, I was happier as a single mom than I am with you. And she'd go, it was easier because I didn't have to rely on anybody. And when I have to rely on you, you're not reliable. And that just makes it worse. Yes. Because when I knew it was going to be only me, I could handle that. But when I thought you were going to help me and you didn't, yeah. that made it worse. Yeah. Because I was better off without you. And that was, when we were in the worst of it, I would brush that off as going, oh, she's just pissed. But then I realized, I analyzed the truth of that statement. And it was 100% true. Mm-hmm. When you have no expectations of anybody else, way more manageable. When you have expectations of someone, when they give you that assurance that you can rely on them and they let you down, that is so much worse. Yes. It's so much worse than if there was nobody there at all. And she was right. And I admit it, she was right. 
there were times where it would have been easier if I was not involved, 100%. And I own that. And I have to own that. Otherwise, I'll never correct that behavior. I'll always keep being that kind of do, 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 my wife will take care of it kind of guy. And I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. And I know I don't want to be that person because I want to have a launch relationship because this woman that I'm married to is my entire reason for being. Not my entire reason for being. She is the main reason I am being. <laughs> I want to make her, I want to make her the reason I get up in the morning. I want her to be the joy I feel in my life. I want her to be my motivation to be successful at work. I want her to be my motivation to be successful in everything that I do. I want her not to put her on a pedestal or you know, deify her. But I want that connection to be so close that we are one person. I want to be one person with my wife. I want to be so close that we are indistinguishable. Mm. And I want us to be so connected that one, nothing can break us apart and that we are much stronger together than if we are separate. Because I know that she is the person that I was meant to be with. And I know that I can say that hundred percent confidently cross my heart, hope to die. Mm -hmm. She is the person I was meant to be with my entire life. And my kids are meant to be the people I was supposed to be with. I am supposed to be where I'm at. Yeah. And I want to make sure that is a lifelong thing. I and I want it to continue for as long as I am living on this planet and beyond whatever comes next. I want it to continue and I want to bring them with me and I want them to be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, my, I was I, I, scrolling through TikTok and there's this guy on there and he's schizophrenic and he sees people and they give him messages. They teach him things. And mm -hmm. he said, one of the things that they tell me over and over again is don't be afraid of death. Because where you go is where you think you're going to go. So if you think that okay. field of daisies, then when you die, you go to a field of daisies. And so ever since okay. then, death for me is my husband's kiss. When I kiss my husband, I come like, you know, I come into him, right? Like my husband, mm -hmm. I never believed in soulmates until I had him. The connection is so deep. It's so intense. And when we kiss, it's I come into the kiss. I put all my focus, all my attention into the kiss because when I die, this is where I'm going is in that kiss. So I want that's you to. Beautiful. Think... That's beautiful. That's a beautiful. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So I wrote Dating 101 for teens. Are you going to get it for them? I, I want it 100% for my daughter. She is only 13 and she's already had. A bad relationship because yeah. she because what happened was that she misjudged the nature of a guy not her fault no. in any way shape or form but she misjudged him he turned out to be an asshole yeah. and it affected her negative very negatively emotionally there was you know verbal things rumors started by this guy that she was dating and it was just a terrible situation and I want the relationship that she deserves. As a human being, she deserves a happy relationship with someone that she can trust, respect, and can be that vulnerable person with her. And I want that for her, no question. And my boys are getting to that age where they're going to start seeking out those relationships as well. My oldest, not so much. I mean, and he's fine. He doesn't really care about that stuff. Right. Um, but the other two, they're starting to notice. They're starting to you know, have those conversations with people. And I want them to be set up and I want to give them the example of what that positive relationship is. Mm -hmm. I want to give them the example that, yes, you can have vulnerable conversations with your wife. You can tell your wife that she's right when you're being an asshole. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and my wife and I, we've had these discussions. It's like we can maintain this openness with our kids, show them our relationship, show them that positive relationship. And up until recently, I hadn't been doing that. I've been showing them the wrong thing. I've been showing them that, you know, I've been showing them, you know, inadvertently that a husband doesn't have to respect his wife. A husband doesn't have to be useful. A husband doesn't have to listen to his wife. You know, showing them that, hey, 
you can kind of do whatever you want. You can be a dick. You can deny what she says and nothing will happen. You mm -hmm. know, I don't want to show them that the women or men, whoever they're in a relationship with later deserves that respect. They deserve to be listened to, to be validated. And that you as an adult in a relationship like that and just take your responsibility for your actions. And especially my boys, because, you know, like you said, society doesn't want function. They want dysfunction. Yeah. And they've been putting no responsibility on men for the longest time. And basically in society, men have been allowed to do kind of whatever they want. Mm -hmm. You know, women are these prizes, objects, goals, whatever. Things. And things. They were things. And I certainly don't want my daughter to feel like that. And I don't want them to feel like that's what women are. And I want to be that good example that says, hey, your wife is probably the most valuable thing in your life. That is where you're going to find the deepest connection with someone. That is the person who is going to be your partner. That is the person who is going to be your teammate. The person who is there for you when you are down. The person who can help you when you need it. And they're that person you can give your entire self to. And for that to happen, you need to have those vulnerable moments. You need to have those emotional connections. And you need to be open to them. Yeah. And, and you know, part of that is, you know, taking responsibility, taking your medicine, <laughs> if you will. You know, addressing that ego. But also as a, as a no, person, no. you need to protect yourself like a super important lesson because it helps us choose the right partners when we learn to protect ourselves against people who are wrong for us. Yes. I hope you get dating 101 as soon as possible. I want, yes, no. I want you, the parents to go through it first because this is sex ed. Okay. And so I want to make sure you're comfortable with the book before you hand it over because I respect yeah. your boundaries as a parent. I never want to overstep you. So if there's some chapters in there you think they're too young for at this time, then what I recommend you do is you keep the book and you select one or two chapters to go through once every other week. The chapters okay. are short, read them together and then have a discussion about them. No, that's a great strategy. You know, when it comes to that stuff, we are, we're really open you know, with our kids. You know, we've always wanted to, and we've agreed on this from the get go is we want our kids to be able to trust us enough to when they get in situations like they find in dating relationships, if they are uncomfortable, they can tell us about it. Right. If they feel like they're in the wrong situation, they can tell us about it. We can help them. Yeah. You know, growing up, you know, my wife and I both, we've shared our stories about, you know, dating relationships when we were younger. We couldn't talk to our parents about that kind of stuff. You know, we never really had those conversations. We never felt that they were there for us in those situations. And that put us in bad situations that we didn't have the tools to get out of. You know, we had to learn those lessons with all of the consequences associated. Now we know they need to learn those lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those lessons they have to learn themselves. We can tell them all we want about how to avoid these bad situations, but they're teenagers. They're not going to listen to us hundred percent. Right. And when they put themselves in situations we want them to be able to ask us for help and that we will not punish them for asking us for help. Yeah. And so that's how we've always done it. You know, we've been really open about that stuff. It's like, Hey, these situations are going to happen. Yeah. Here's what we experienced. Here's what, you know, here's what you can do to make those better or avoid them entirely. And if you get in a situation and you don't know what to do, just call us, just let us know. And we want to have that open conversation with them to where later on in life, if they need advice, they're going to ask us. And they're not going to be in the situations that my wife and I found ourselves in where we were in a bad way, but we couldn't talk to our parents about it because we get kicked out of the house yeah. or, you know, we would lose our privileges or we, you know, it'd be a total, you know, total catastrophe, right? Our lives would be over. If, we, if I told my dad about this, oh, I could never tell him, right. you know, we don't, we wanted to be anything but that really it is, you know, we try to look at what our past was and say, we're not going to be those parents. We're going to be parents that 
have that respect for our kids, that trust our kids to be able to recognize those situations, recognize those bad behaviors and talk to us about it. Yeah. And we're and also the parents who are emotional leaders. So not are, only are we going to be the parents that our kids can talk to. My, my husband said to his kids, you can say anything to me, anything. You can tell me to fuck off if you want to. You can say anything. <laughs> So, you know, and so they've always had that open communication, but it's not just that as you're doing, right? There's so many parts of the equation to raising kids, which is why I didn't do it because I know how much work it is. It's not just creating the safe space for them to come and communicate, it's creating the safe space for them to actually feel safe because when you and your wife aren't doing well, they don't feel good. No. They got fear, they've got stress going on because you guys are fearful and stressed. So when you change your emotions to happy and calm and communicative, they change to happy, calm and communicative because we infect each other. You are wonderful, Tyler. So I would love it if you got Dating 101, read the book, Mm -hmm. and at some point, either right after reading the book or after you know, you worked with the kids with the book and you see some changes in them. I'd love to get your feedback again. Sure. I would love, Absolutely. I'm going to be watching for your DM. <laughs> I will, because I love this. I love when people come to me and they go, I need, I want to tell you how I changed. I'm like, hell yes. Can we share this with the world? This is, it's the evolution revolution. I want to create spaces where people can share these stories and influence, in fact, more people love infection this is the best disease we're going to spread here right best kind of virus (laughs) virus happiness contentment which is like happiness on steroids right like i'm just so good the communication the peace and we are evolving better brains when we do this because a calmer brain is better able to make better decisions yeah, for sure. No, absolutely. I think, let me go look at it. I was, I really, I, hand to God, I was planning on buying that, yeah. not only for my daughter, but now that you mentioned it, I think my sons would benefit from it as well. 100%. 100%. Yeah. You said I want 100% for your daughter. And I was thinking for the boys too, because I wrote it for all of them. Information is in our, in, you know, in our parenting, we always want to side towards more information. You know, society is dictated. Oh, protect your kids from this, protect your kids from that. Don't tell them about that. That's only going to like, that's only going to, don't tell them this, don't tell them this. We don't, we don't want that. We want to give our kids information, more information, because it's going to give them more of a leg to stand on. It's going to give them more presence of mind in those moments to fall back on and go, okay, is the situation bad? I learned about this when I was 12. I learned about this when I was 11. I learned about this when I was 14. All these things kind of agree that this situation is not good. So mm-hmm. maybe it's probably not good, yeah. you know, rather than going, is the situation good? I can't really look at it objectively because I just seeing with my own eyes, this person seems okay, but something is kind of in the background. I don't know. I'm just going to ignore that. I'm just going to go for it. Right. So we want to give them as many tools as we can so they can fall back on that information and come out of situations, you know, in a more positive way. And more or less, I fully agree that information is almost you know, pretty much never bad. Mm-hmm. You know, information can only help as long as it's information that is coming from a good and positive and healthy place, right? Knowledge is power. Knowledge Thank- is power, for sure. Knowledge is power. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate you so much. I'm looking forward to hearing from you again. And keep updating me on your story, on your evolution. Yes, um, of course. We are all behind you. We are so super happy to see what's happening. When you were talking about, you know, taking responsibility for, you know, sh- before shunning the responsibility for the emotional load, I heard thousands of women cheering. I'm telling you, every single woman who's going to listen to this podcast is cheering you on, Tyler. I'm so happy to hear that. Honestly, I'm so happy I stumbled upon your live that day last was it last month was in july i think it was in july it's like last month and i was like oh what is this those are kind of weird what are these three rules what's going on and then i saw all the positivity and the 
I immediately thought of my daughter. That's exactly what I've been thinking of. I said, I wish my daughter had this information a year ago when she got in with that bad dude. Yeah. I wish she had this. I hope that she can have this information and she become a person that can recognize these behaviors as negative behaviors and can protect herself in those situations and not waste her time on these guys. Yeah. Find herself a man, whoever she dates. If she wants to date a woman, okay, that's amazing. There's still positive traits for anybody. Absolutely. You've got to look for these negative behaviors and you've got to filter those people out. And I said, and my, so my first thought was, my daughter needs to meet this person. And my second thought was, I kind of might be one of these guys. I might need to, I might need to fix these behaviors because this is not lining up with the way I'm acting. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to be this person that she's describing as a guy. I want to be this man. Yes. So from there, I said, this is my sign. I said, this is it. I said, this is what, this is that, the little, you know, Tinkerbell in my ear. This is where I need to go. This is my, this is where my path needs to lead. And I, I don't believe in coincidences. So I think I was, I needed what you were talking about. And I, like you said, I need to infect as many people as possible. I need to spread this around and I need to tell people about this. Love you for that, Tyler. <laughs> Thank you so much. Say hi to your Thank wife. So much for having us. Of course I will. Her name's Q, by the way. Hi, Q? Q, yeah, Q-U-E. So it was kind of a leftover nickname from the army. So her last name is, it was Kishpe. So, but nobody could pronounce Kishpe. So they're like, ah, oh, she's Sergeant Q. Sergeant Q. And so it just stuck. And she's like, I like it better than my first name anyway. So I'm just, you know. I love that. I love that. 